And I want to share with the audience why I wanted you on. Mm -hmm. You research uh, a compound called urolithin A, which mm -hmm. I have had many questions on. Mm -hmm. In addition, you have looked at and researched skeletal muscle and mitochondria. Mm -hmm. We'll talk all about frailty, sarcopenia, sure. and protein. Mm -hmm. But I would love for you to share a bit about how you got interested mm -hmm. in this compound called urolithin A mm -hmm. and the origin story for how it even became of interest. Sure. So the, the story is 15 years plus. Uh, so we started with a very simple idea that we're going to disrupt how science is done in the nutrition area. So a lot of companies uh, were blending probiotics, prebiotics, multivitamins, and, and just you know starting to sell products in the market. And there was very, so we said, let's bring the biotech approach to, nutri to nutrition. And uh, we started with this idea that we're gonna find new natural compounds that had previously not been attributed any health benefit to. So we started with thousands of compounds uh, we looked at what was the superfoods at that time. Palm granite was one of them. Um, berries was another one. So we started looking into it. Palm granite, and you won't believe it, we went around the world. We went to wow. Israel. We went to uh, Spain. We sourced palm granites from around the world just to see what, what was in the different palm granites. So let's say the first four or five years of that journey was just deconstructing the palm granite. And we found like hundreds of compounds in the palm granite. And then we started studying which were the key actives that would have these immense health benefits because I don't know if you know the pomegranate field there was a lot of uh, literature around that time that drinking pure pomegranate yes. juice was going to help cognition with you know delay some of the you know uh, ben um, aging related attributes to cognitive decline with aging so we zeroed in on urolithin A at that time which was thought to be a waste product uh, why we urolithin A so this is an interesting story. We, we, we are based out of the Swiss Institute of Technology, which is one of the top universities in Europe, actually top 20. And it would be the Harvard or MIT. It, it of... is actually the MIT equivalent. Yes. And so we had given uh, in, in the aging field, so we were very, always very focused on the aging field. We gave these hundreds of compounds to this professor of, who was very famous in the mitochondrial field called Professor Ulbrichs. And he came running. He, he did not know. We had blinded him. And he came and said, what is this one compound that you gave me because it's extending the lifespan of worms because that's where all the aging research starts by like 45 percent wow and nothing else matches that except caloric restriction so things like nad boosting uh, modulation does boost the lifespan by 20 percent um, resveratrol for example does a similar 15 to 20 percent uh, metformin comes the closest to caloric restriction, 40%. So he was so excited that he said 45% and caloric restriction does it by like 50, 55%. So that's how we got into it because before we had not paid attention to this molecule called urolithin A because it was thought as a waste product. And then he said, well, it's this molecule. And so that started 15 years wow. of research. That was pretty exciting, wasn't it? it? it it's, it's that, you know, when you start from a notion that you would do this for the next 10 years, but you're never sure what you're gonna land up with. And then you have after seven, eight years, mm -hmm. the Eureka moment. And then it was clear to us that we needed to take it to humans, do multiple randomized trials. And that's what we have been doing till about a few years back, we got convinced to launch the product. Wow. And the urolithin A compound, you had mentioned that it was, was it originally discovered from pigs eating acorns? Yeah, so it, it was, uh, that's a funny story. Um, so Iberian ham, right? And it tastes so good. Which Everybody... I've never had. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it's uh, it was known, acorn is another source. So the origins of urolithin A is that it's a postbiotic molecule. So what does that mean? That means that your gut microbiome would metabolize the dietary precursors that are present in these superfoods like pomegranates and berries. So these ha have what we call polyphenols. And the, there's a class of polyphenols called elegitanins. So these become metabolized by the gut microbiome to release this molecule which by the gut, which is called a postbiotic urolithin A. Trick is not, you can be drinking a glass of juice or a bowl of berries, but a lot of people, about two thirds of the population doesn't have the right gut microbiome. And so that started the other side of the story that if two thirds of the world healthy population is not able to make this molecule naturally, like, you know, we need to supplement them. And so that's, mm. that's the whole. 
And how did you guys come to that conclusion? You were saying that certain populations have the capacity based on their gut microbiome mm -hmm. to take these allagitanins and make this postbiotic urolithin A. Mm -hmm. So we have run randomized clinical trials the world over. We've gone and looked into the French population, the Italians, Canadians, many trials in the US, and I'm running uh, one in Asia and India, actually, my, my origin country. And it's fascinating because in, in Europe, we see about 30 to 40% people have this molecule at different mm -hmm. levels. Now, are those levels enough to give you what I call a therapeutic benefit? We, probably not, but from dietary exposure, that means these people have the right gut microbiome to convert and make urolithin A. In the US, it's even lower. It's like 10 to 12%. So we did a study in Chicago downtown area and it was about 10 to 12% people had it. If you give them a glass so of- So 90% of individuals will be unable to leverage this- 90% of individuals- Will not. Were not getting in, in from real world diet. Now, if you give them the healthy diet, which not everybody is uh, eating- Yeah, and in Chicago, they just eat a lot of pizza. Yeah, <laughs> then you can boost that number up to let's say 30%. Hmm. In India, what I'm figuring out is that it's actually very low. I'm not a producer. I, I, I can drink six glasses and I have actually had six glasses of juice in one go and my body refuses to make it. And I think it's because the, your gut microbiome is seeded in the first thousand days of your life. And a lo lot of practice in these, let's say, countries in Asia and Africa is to give a lot of antibiotics. And I'm, mm. I, you know, my parents told me I, got, I had pneumonia, all kinds of stuff uh, at that time. And I took a lot of antibiotics and that I think messed my gut microbiome forever. Hmm. That that's an unusual thought because I think a lot of people are thinking, well, there's nothing I can do about that. We do know that you can modify the gut microbiome. You can, yeah. But maybe not in the capacity to then generate particular compounds. Do you do you believe that's true? I, I believe that's eighty percent true. I, I think in let's say the developed world in the Europe and US you can certainly train your gut microbiome to a certain extent because if you're not eating the right foods if you're you know if you're supplementing with probiotics and prebiotics maybe there's a chance if you have the right flora and we know actually now what's the right gut microbiome that you need to produce your A. I think in countries where like from from india there's absolutely no chance because yeah your your gut microbiome is laid in the first thousand days of life mm -hmm. and then you think you can eat right and you're eating right but you're getting and i think that's the idea the gut microbiome is is a to me is a polypharmacy it's it's really is this source of immense healthy molecules that should be mined for and we'll talk about your a for sure yeah of course it is it's very fascinating and the how would someone know if they're a producer and by the way um i have a test in my kitchen i do i have not taken it mm -hmm. How would someone off the street or is it something that people can test for? So it's a test I developed, uh, you know. You I, developed it? I developed it. I bled uh, many you of my- You are really an underachiever. I mean, you must just look at yourself in the mirror and go, gosh. I, I bled uh, myself. Uh, I could contribute more. <laughs> all, all my 10 fingers. I took all my colleagues, even this, you know, uh, all the founders and I, you know, kind of gave them a glass of juice and tried to see. So we have now developed a a minimally invasive test. It's, it requires it's a, blood test, right? it's a dry blood spot test. It requires a little finger prick, spotting a few drops of blood, and you send it to a lab in the US. And, and in a few days, we know if you're a producer or not, because this molecule is easily detectable in the in, mm. in, in circulation in the blood. Is it an all or none? Actually, no. Actually, what we see is about 60% people don't make it at all even if they are exposed to a healthy diet, then there are about 20, 30% who have the right microbiome, but just need to be eating right. And that when you provide that, mm -hmm. they, they can make certain low levels of, of urolithin A, which may not be enough to, to give you these immense, powerful mitochondrial and longevity benefits. 10%, mm -hmm. which I'm fascinated by absolutely, because these are what I call the blessed ones, uh, they, they are born, I don't know, with the right microbiome, they eat right, and, and these are what I call super producers. Uh, and 
I have in mind a study where I want to follow these super producers and really see if their muscle health actually, you know, and we can talk about it, is already so powerful that they don't need any supplementation. <laughs>